Well, good morning. It's great to be sharing with you today. Trust that you're doing really well. What an incredible verse that we set out for this year to be our focus. And we pray that would be our reality in John 20, verse 21. Peace be with you as the Father has sent me. I am sending you. And we've taken a few weeks and we're unpacking the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah says to King Ataxerxes in chapter two and verse five, send me to the city. What an incredible statement and incredible encouragement and commission for you and I to be sent to the city. And it's such a great challenge for us in this pandemic where everything is about looking after us and focusing on ourselves to remember to look up and remind ourselves that there is still a harvest for us to bring in, that there's still a city uh, to be reached. We still have neighbours that don't know Jesus. We still have family members who've drifted away from the faith that we're believing that we have been sent to bring back home and bring in the harvest. And as we've been hearing over these past few weeks, Nehemiah has been sent by the king. He goes, as we heard Thomas preach last week, and inspects the walls. And then this this moment happens in chapter two. Nehemiah chapter two, verse 17. Nehemiah says this, Then I said to them, You see the trouble that we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins. Its gates have been burnt with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. Let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. And then they replied in verse 18, let us start rebuilding. Let us start rebuilding. And so they began this good work. And what follows chapter two is, of course, chapter three. And in chapter three, it's almost the greatest team building exercise of the Old Testament. This team is gathered together and assembled to begin building the walls. And the whole of chapter three lists out all of the people that began rebuilding these walls. If I'm honest, it's a part of the Bible that when I'm reading my Bible plan and I see the list of names, if you're anything like me, I kind of speed read it and skip through it because these names don't mean anything to me. I don't have any context for who these people were. And yet uh, this was a significant list at the time that it was written. Some people believe that this list was actually sent back to King Artaxerxes to report on how the work was going. And so to be named on this list was very significant. I remember a few years ago, and you will have heard us talk about this, we went to view an an old church building just up the road from where our church building used to be on King Street. And as we went round this building, we went up into an attic, and there in the attic was this big picture with many people's faces on it. And what had happened is our old building, when it had closed down, had merged with this church way back um, in the last century, had merged with this church that we were now viewing. And in this picture was, was the faces of the men who had built our previous church building. It was, it was a marker, and there was a, a beautiful picture of our, our old church building gleaming with it's granite and then all of these faces who meant nothing to us with their big beards and their suits and yet these were the people that had sacrificed and had built. They had been so important at the time to to building that building that has served the body of Christ for for generations after it. And as I looked at this chapter three, it reminded me of that picture. People who at one time, though we have no context for them, people who sacrificed and who built and did something incredible. In chapter three, there's 38 individuals that are named, 42 different people groups, as well as many others who weren't listed in the list, but were part of this huge endeavor and task to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And what they accomplished in such a short space of time is remarkable. Now, we're not going to read all of the chapter together, but let's read just the first five verses just to give you a context. You can go back and read through all of these names. Um, But just the first five verses says this, Eliashib the high priest and his fellow priests went to work and rebuilt the sheep gate. They dedicated it and set its doors in place, building as far as the Tower of the Hundred, which they dedicated, and as far as as the Tower of Hananel. The men of Jericho built the adjoining section and Zachar, son of Imri, built the next to them. The fish gate was rebuilt by the sons of Hassanah. They laid its beams and put its doors and bolts and bars in place. 
Merimoth, son of Uriah, the son of Hakoz, repaired the next section. Next to him, Meshalam, the son of Berechiah, the son of Meshezabel, uh, made repairs. And next to him, Zadok, son of Bana, also made repairs. The next section was repaired by the men of Tekoa. Their nobles would not put their shoulders to the work under their supervisors. And the list goes on and the names get more unpronounceable as it goes on. But here were people that rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem under the leadership of Nehemiah. And the restoration of Jerusalem, the rebuilding of these walls was dependent on the four words spoken by the people as recorded in chapter two, verse 17. Let us start rebuilding. Let us start rebuilding. See, Nehemiah going and Nehemiah inspecting and Nehemiah challenging the people was not enough to accomplish this task. It was the response and willingness from the people that meant that these walls could be built again. This was Nehemiah's great recruitment moment. He recruited people to join in the the task of rebuilding the walls. And today's title is this in the series, Recruitment for What Will Be. Recruitment for What Will Be. And I wanna say to you today, it's recruitment day. Congratulations, you're hired. We're so pleased that you got the role. We're so pleased that you're on the team. It's great to have you on board. We're excited for all that we're gonna achieve together. Uh, And what a dream team we are. And of course, if I came into your home and I shook your hand or I bashed your elbow or or we touched feet, uh, then you would rightly ask me, what am I meant to be doing? What are you recruiting me for? What are you congratulating me uh, on? And my response, and I wonder if this was Nehemiah's response to the people that came forward, is this, do what you can. Do what you can. See, I wonder if as as people put up their hand and said, let's start rebuilding, I wanna rebuild. And they came to Nehemiah and they said to Nehemiah, what should I do? Where do I go? What, What part will I play? I wonder as we unpack this chapter, whether it would be true to say that Nehemiah's response to them was just do what you can. Be part of the team and help where you can. See the four words, let us start rebuilding. They turned on the engine, but it was the four words, do what you can, that meant the vehicle started moving and the walls began being rebuilt. See, it's no good for us just to have good intentions. Good intentions need to be followed up by action for us to to do something. And we're going to split this phrase up and they're going to give us our four points today. Do what you can. Do what you can. See, the first thing is do. The first point is do. The people listed in chapter three were not expert wall builders. In fact, most of them weren't even builders at all. But they had one thing in common. They were willing. And listed in chapter three are priests, goldsmiths, perfumers, uh, rulers, both men and women, Levites, merchants. And there's even one man who roped his daughters into helping him. And I was looking through the, uh, the commentaries, I was reading this one old commentary and it said, even the women folk were involved in building the walls. I thought, wow, what a phrase, the women folk. But everybody was involved. There was no, no skills or experience needed. It was just the willingness to do something. And they all understood that the wall couldn't be built by Nehemiah alone. Neither could it be built by them talking or dreaming or being inspired about or painting a picture of. No, it took them to do something. They understood that something needed to be done. And maybe today for you, it's time to start doing something. As Christians, we're called to action. Remember that we don't earn our salvation by doing stuff, by by working. We don't work for our salvation. We're saved by grace. But because we're saved by grace, then it's it's our privilege, our mission. We are sent to make a difference in this world, to share this good news with other people, to bring his kingdom and build his church. Paul writes in in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 14, and he reminds the church there in Corinth that we're members of a body, that just as the human body is made up of different parts, so the church is made up of different parts, that, that each member has a special and unique function to perform. And we cannot be in a body, part of a body, and not be active. 
In fact, if you've got something in your body or on your body that's dead, then you're getting it chopped off or out because it's no good for you. You can't have it there. And we must understand that we can't be a dead part of the body. Each and every one of us has a unique function. Each and every one of us is, has a part to play. I remember being told that when I die, then I'll go to heaven and there'll be a two TV screens. One will show all the good things that I did and one will show all the bad things that I did and there'll be a decision made of whether I can get into heaven. But can I tell you, that's not the basis for our salvation. That's not what's gonna happen, uh, going to happen to you when you die. What will happen is you'll go in and remember we're saved by grace. It's, it's, it's his blood that we're washed in. It's Jesus who covers us. That's how we, uh, we get our names in the Lamb's book of life when we, when we enter into eternity. But what will happen when we go to eternity is we will reach a judgment seat and what will be judged is not how good and bad we We've, we've been, but what we did with what was, what was trusted with us, uh, to us on this earth, that's what we'll be judged about. What do we do with the time, the talent, the treasure, the resources that were given to us? How did we sow them into eternity? And I know that there'll be hours of time allotted in my life to things that don't matter for eternity. But all of the things that I sowed into eternity, all the things that I, that I used to bring his kingdom and build his church, there will be a prize awaiting me in heaven, a reward because of what I did with what was trusted to me. So can I encourage you, let's do something of eternal significance. Let's do something for his kingdom, to bring his kingdom and build his church. See, we gotta do something. But the second point is this, what? Do what? What do you want me to do? What is there to do? See, we've been talking about how we're sent to the city. We've been praying about it through our 21 days of prayer and fasting. What does it mean for us to be sent to the city? What, what do I do practically? And I would say to you today, do anything. Just find some way, no matter how small, to serve and to bring his kingdom. See, uh, and, and, and we see here in chapter three that several times it's mentioned that people built right in front of their homes. That where the wall was opposite their home or maybe even their, wall, their, their home was attached in some way to the wall, that's where Nehemiah asked them to build. See, it starts at home. And there's an important truth for us that city transformation begins at home. See, there's two institutions that God has set in place on the earth, the church and the family. And I wonder today if the what that God is asking you to do is to look again at your family, how you serve and how you love at home. I was reminded in the summertime as we saw the, the tragic murder of George Floyd and, and everything that came out of that and this overwhelming sense of so many injustices in our world, which people began, it seems, to talk about more and more. And it's easy to become overwhelmed. And as I was praying one day, I was reminded of something that Mother Teresa said. She said this, if you wanna change the world, go home and love your family. See, it starts at home. Nehemiah asked people to build right where their homes were initially. And then they continued on. See, it starts at home, but then it goes to outside your home. It starts with our families, but then it goes to our surroundings. What is there around you already? See, sometimes we think about the city and we get overwhelmed, but actually there's things that are right around us. The people understood they couldn't get overwhelmed with the huge task of building the walls of Jericho. What they had to do was pick up stone by stone, brick by brick. And the, the saving of our city seems overwhelming. 220,000 people, but it's done person by person that we look who is around us, what is around us, and, and we begin to build and serve with what God has put around us. See, when Nehemiah describes uh, what this incredible team were doing, he uses the word rebuild. Over and over in this chapter, the word rebuild. And when we, uh, when we understand the, the word rebuild in the Hebrew language, it gives us this picture that the resources were already, were already there. There was no new stone that was needed. The stone that they needed was already in the debris at their feet. And it got me thinking that sometimes when we think about, uh, about being sent and, and serving God, we think that we have to do something new or different in order to be sent. But I wonder today that, I wonder if we could realize or consider that 
where we are right now could be the purpose for which we've been commissioned for. Maybe the family that you're in, the street that you live on, the workplace where you work, the school that you attend or the university where you study. And maybe God isn't looking for something strange and new, but he's looking for you to see what's right in front of you, that he's put you there for a purpose. And maybe where you have been sent is where you already are. And he's asking you to pick up those stones and build with what he's given you already. You know, over the last lockdown in the summertime of last year, the spring and the summer, I was praying one day and walking around our neighborhood on my daily exercise and asking God to help me to reach people better, to serve my community, to play some role beyond the church. You know, in the privileged role that I have to serve all of you, sometimes most of my time can be spent around Christians. And I was saying to God, how do I build genuine friendships and relationships with those that don't know you yet? And I felt God say to me, well, what do you enjoy doing? Because often when we think about evangelizing and reaching people, we think, well, it's gotta be something that I don't enjoy doing. But God said to me, what do you enjoy doing? And many of you know, will know, I love gardening, I love growing. And so I began thinking and looking around and seeing that many people have started community gardens. And so then I, 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 I went on this journey, asked the council, it's a long story, but in mid-August, we dug the first piece of grass out on Seaview Community Garden in the Bridge of Don, round the corner from where I live. And I'm still the sole member of Seaview Community Garden, but I'm believing for 2021 that as I'm sent to the city, I'm gonna get more people to help me and get to know some people. Uh, but I, I wanted to encourage you just with that story, because maybe there's something you, you already do that you love. Maybe there's a place where you already are and all that God is asking you to do is change your perspective and see that he sent you there for a reason, that he has a purpose uh, for you uh, in the area that you are and with the gifting that he's already put and the passions that he's already put inside of you. See, we've got to do what, and the third word is you. You, do what you See, you are recruited and sent to the city because you are you. You have a new, unique contribution to make. And sometimes we easily excuse ourselves because we think that we're not right, that we wouldn't be good enough. And we think, well, it's not really send me to the city, it's send them to the city. They're more qualified. They're better at doing this. But actually, God has sent you to the city. See, people on this list could have easily excused themselves. Hardly any of them were qualified for the job and yet all of them rose up with a sense of willingness. I love this, that, that last verse in, in verse five, how it says there about the nobles of Tekoa. And Tekoa was a town about 10 miles away from Jerusalem and yet the people of Tekoa, Tekoa uh, were willing to go and help rebuild the walls. But it says that the, the rulers would not put their shoulders to the work. Uh, and we get this idea that they were kind of stiff-necked, prideful people. They wouldn't go and help with rebuilding the walls. But I love that the people of Tekoa still went they didn't look at who was around them and above them and what they were doing. They just had a determination that they would help. They didn't worry about other people. They worried about them. And they knew that they had a contribution to make. Listen, there was no job description for this team. There was no expectations for people. All that Nehemiah was looking for was willingness. There wasn't a mold that he was trying to fit people in, a ruler that he was trying to measure people with. It was just willingness. Because what the team needed was them, not their skill and experience, just willingness that they bought. And the list that Nehemiah compiles of these names is the most random mis mismatch of people uh, that do not belong together, let alone building a wall. And yet, because of this united cause, they were brought together and, and each of them uniquely and individually, it brought them alive. They had a role to play. And, and this mismatch of unqualified people rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. And you are needed to build this city to rebuild the, the walls, as it were, of Aberdeen, to reach the people, to serve our city, to see his kingdom come and see Aberdeen transformed, needs you. And not necessarily your experience, not necessarily your skills, but your willingness to say, I will be part of this. I realise that I have a unique contribution uh, to bring. But this wasn't just about everyone doing their own thing. 
It wasn't just about building their own section in their own particular way, putting their own slant on it, using their own stone and cutting it how they wanted to cut. No, they knew that there was a bigger vision, a mission. They knew there was a, uh, something that Nehemiah had planned out and they were willing to submit to this. And here's some great preaching cheese for you today uh, because we have to put the you in unity. Put the you in unity. See, if we go down the track of uh, our individuality and our uniqueness without realising that it's together with others that we come alive, that we shine brighter when we're put together with others, that your unique colour and shape uh, is accentuated and enhanced when you stand with others. Let's not be mavericks trying to do our own thing, but let's stand with people and be part of doing something extraordinary. There were 40 sections of this wall that were being repaired simultaneously, 40 areas all the way round Jerusalem, and yet they worked in unity. All of them knew that they had something unique to bring, and yet all of them knew that it was together that they were going to build this wall. And if you read the chapter and you get past the difficult to pronounce names, you'll see this beautiful phrase all the way through, next to them, and next to them, and next to them, because these people were building and right next to them was somebody else building alongside them. And, and uh, I want to encourage us, let's stand together side by side, taking responsibility and building and reaching and being sent to what we have been sent to uniquely but together. See, we got to do what you, and the last word is can, do what you can. See, there was no expectation from Nehemiah how much people would do. So interesting. He simply invited people and said to them, do what you can. There were no set jobs. All that was required that people would get stuck in and contribute however they could. And what you do in being sent to the city may never be spoken about on the platform. It may never be put in a video, it may be never told in a book, but your quiet serving, your willingness to play your part where you are working and where you are reaching is how we'll transform this city. See, Nehemiah records that some worked hard, some didn't work so hard, some did more, some did double the work of other people. Some just worked and some worked earnestly and zealously, but everybody did what they could. And there is no comparison, there's no comment on people who serve better than others or built more than others. See, some had more glamorous parts of the wall. Some had more hidden, less glamorous parts of the wall to build. And yet all of them are counted as contributing to this bigger picture. And I want to encourage you to never see what you're doing is too small or that people don't recognise it because it is these small acts and the small moments of taking responsibility. This is how we'll transform the city. This is how we will reach the city. One of my most famous, uh, favourite stories of all time is that of the building of St Paul's Cathedral. In 1666, most of London was flattened by that great fire. And what, maybe one of the most famous architects has ever been, Christopher Wren, he rebuilt London. And the jewel in, his, in the crown of this rebuilding was St. Paul's Cathedral. And one day in 1671, Christopher Wren went on a site visit and he went to see how the building work was doing. And he came across three bricklayers. And he went to the first one and he said, what are you doing? The bricklayer replied, well, I'm a bricklayer. I'm, I'm working hard laying bricks to, build my, uh, to feed my family. Then he goes to the next one, he says, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm a builder, I'm building a wall. And then he goes to the third one and he asks him, what are you doing? And this guy responds to him and he says, I'm a cathedral builder. I'm building a great cathedral to the Almighty. What a perspective to have. They were doing the same job and yet only one of them understood that they were part of a much bigger story. And this is how we transform our city. Each and every person just doing what they can playing their individual role, doing something, doing anything, bringing their unique contribution and doing as much of it as they can as they possibly can. There is no comparison about better or worse or how much or how little. It's just that we do what we can. And if we could all understand this truth, that I'm transforming a city. Oh, I'm just delivering a meal to somebody. No, you're, you're transforming a city. No, I'm just coming alongside a young person and helping them. No, you're transforming a city. I'm just doing the laundry and, and uh, uh, cooking for my kids and doing my homeschooling. No, you're transforming a city. 
And if all of us could understand this perspective that as we do what we can, we'll see our city transformed. As you do what you can, we'll see our city transformed. And I wonder today if you could make that commitment with me that we will do what we can, that we'll have that willingness. And when when the question comes, what do you want me to do? We'll say to you, just do what you can, wherever you can, however you can, just play your part. And we're gonna ask the Holy Spirit to help us. And I'm believing that today, 24th of January, the Holy Spirit's gonna speak to you. He's gonna give you an idea, or he's gonna spark something in you, or he's gonna change your perspective on something that you're already doing to see that it's actually God sending you to do that, that this is part of your commission, a fresh perspective on what you're already doing, to realize that you have been sent to the city, that you are recruited into this incredible team, And maybe one day we'll be put in a list, maybe we'll be put in a photograph and people in generations to come will look at us and have no context for us, not understand our names, but know that we did something for the glory of God, that we built a cathedral, that we reached a city, that we saw lives transformed and his kingdom come. And they'll know that we did it for his glory and that we saw great things in our generation and in our day. So I wonder what it is for you Let's just quiet our spirits. We're gonna say, Holy Spirit, speak to us. Change our perspective. Help us to see that we've already been sent. Maybe it's a person or an activity. Maybe it's a hobby that you have that God is asking you to use to reach people. And I wanna encourage you today, why don't you write that down, make a note of it and pray on it and ask God to help you in that. But you know, we're only able to go and do, only able to do what we can because Jesus came and did what only he could do. And Jesus came to earth, lived a perfect life, but died a criminal's death. And when he hung on the cross, he took all the wrong things that humans have ever done and ever will do. He took sin on himself. And when he died on the cross, sin died with him. And the wonderful news is that three days later, Jesus rose again so that we, and he's alive, and we can know new life in him if we put our trust in him. And it's almost like Jesus bridges the gap between, uh, between us and God, that the, the wrong thing, sin in our lives, creates a gap between us and God. But Jesus, with his arms outstretched, just as Ian has been sharing and reminding us through communion today, bridged that gap. And I wanna encourage you and invite you to walk over that bridge. Maybe you've been inspired today and you don't really know where you are with what you believe about God and and your relationship with God, but you've been inspired with the idea and the picture of a city transformed. You know that, that there's work to be done and you're excited about that, but we only do what we can because we know uh, Him. He is our reason. He is our motive. It's, it's Jesus. And we want to encourage you into that relationship with Jesus, to have that relationship with God again or for the first time today. And all it takes is just a prayer in your heart that says, God, I invite you into my life. I want to begin that relationship with you. You might have many questions, but it begins with a simple invitation, inviting God into your heart. So if that's you, we'd love to help you connect with you. Please message on the chat or text a pastoral number that you've seen up or or contact us through the website. We would love to help you on your journey of faith and come and recruit you to be part of the family of God and come and join us on this incredibly exciting uh, journey that we're on to transforming our city. But let's pray together as we close today. Lord, we thank you for the incredible invitation to be part of bringing your kingdom and building your church in our city at this time. Lord, we wanna hear your words and take them seriously that we have been sent to the city. Lord, and sometimes we're overwhelmed with the vastness, the amount of people and the amount of things that there are to do. But Lord, help us to focus stone by stone, brick by brick to do what you've asked us to do with what's right in front of us. Lord, help us to do what we can. Lord, help us not to compare to others and to see that they're doing more or less or or, or they're doing better than us, but help us to stay focused with what you have asked us to do. And Lord, we pray for people today that are beginning that journey with you. 
And Lord, we pray that they would, you would help them to put their trust in you. We thank you for that promise of salvation. Thank you, Lord, that your word says that when we take one step towards us, Lord, you, you take many, many more towards us, Lord. And thank you that as a people have stepped forward to you, that you are walking towards them, that you're running towards them like a, a father with your arms wide open to embrace them today. In Jesus' name, amen.